Tribal Health and Human Services Department of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes is proud to present Good Medicine, a program dedicated to the wellness of the Flathead Nation. The mission is summarized quite simply, a healthier people, a stronger nation. We will strive to make Good Medicine a reliable source of ideas and information about health issues so that everyone can make informed decisions about their own lifestyle and health care. You will meet health professionals, tribal government and spiritual leaders, and interesting people from the tribal community discussing important health issues that profoundly affect us all. Hello, this is Good Medicine. I'm your host, Larry Pitts. Today, we're going to be talking about a um, very interesting subject. It's called the hantavirus. It's fall. It's time that we need to um, start to look at what this problem can be and what's coming about. Today, we have three guests with us. To my right, immediate right, is Sandy Sorrell. She is our health educator for the tribe. We've got Fred Steele, who is our sanitarian. Boy Wonder. <laughs> and we have um, Wendy Duran, and she's our uh, public health nurse out of the uh, Ronan District. Um, Wendy, why don't we start with you? Um, we we'll get going. Is there anybody on TV line you want to say hello to? Hello, everyone. Um, what I wanted to talk about is what hantavirus is. It's a respiratory uh, disease that's carried by um, deer mice, and it has been located uh, throughout the United States and in Montana. Okay. Well, Fred, we're going to go on introducing everybody here. Is there anybody you want to say hello to, like Debbie or somebody? Hello, Deb. <laughs> Sandy, how about yourself? Hi, guys. Hi, guys. Sandy, since you're our health educator and you, you're, you're, you're our know-all, <laughs> why don't you give us a brief history of the Hunter virus? I mean, it just came into the news about, what, two years ago mm -hmm. in the North, you know, North America? And uh, tell us what's going on. About 1993 is when it showed up in the United States. Before that, Larry, um, about 1950 is when they started documenting cases, and that was in Korea, and um, that happened during the war, and around the 50s it was documented with the soldiers. There were several cases and viruses, but in 1993, that's when um, it showed up in the United States, and it came about in the Four Corners area, down mm -hmm. in um, the southwest, and there were several cases down there. And um, currently, there are over 170 cases that have been confirmed in the United States. And um, in the past, about 50% of these people that contracted the disease died, but now it's only 30%. And um, they attribute that to people knowing the symptoms and the doctors knowing um, the virus also and also getting uh, quick medical attention. Mm -hmm. So in Montana, we've had six cases so far, and um, you know these cases have been as close. We've had one in Sanders, and you know that's right next door. There's Sanders been, County. Yes, yeah, Sanders County. There's been one in um, Great Falls, Browning, um, Billings, Stillwater, <clears throat> and I forgot the other one. But mm -hmm. they're um, you know they're all around Montana. There have been um, trappings in the valley, and. 17% of the mice that were trapped were infected or had the antibodies for the virus. And so, you know, we know that it's here. We know that we've had a confirmed case in um, Sanders County. And we um, want people to be real aware of that and um, take precautions. Okay. How, since we got you going, Sandy, I mean, we, sure. might as well, we might as well sort of focus on you right now. How do you get it? Well, um, people get it by coming in contact with rodent saliva, um, blood, um, their feces, their urine. So this is an airborne thing, and um, people can also get it by being bitten by an infected rodent or by actually touching infected feces and touching their, their eyes or their nose or their mouth. And, um, they can also acquire it by ingesting it too, like right, through, uh, right. through your water source or through your food source too. So then, so if your food isn't covered with this kind of right. stuff, and the mice are on it, they can pass the um, virus onto that right. food, which goes to you then. Right. Okay. Right. 
Mm-hmm. It's not not eating a deer mouse. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, someone from Port Peck might do that. But. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, uh, Wendy. Signs and symptoms. Um, it usually starts with a high temperature, uh, respiratory difficulties, um, muscle aches. It's flu-like symptoms, but the temperature is usually above 101 to about 104 and it's not uh, reduced by medication. Mm-hmm. And so it's, there could be some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and fatigue, and it usually is really quick acting, like within a few hours you're feeling really sick and having severe respiratory problems. Now when you say really quick, is that quick from your contact of the virus, or can, you know, can it lay dormant in your system for a while? It takes one to six weeks to um, from the contact of the virus before you start seeing signs and symptoms. And when it usually hits, it hits really hard and really fast. Now, when you say really hard, I mean, what's that? If I'm sitting out there in TV land right now and I'm saying, what does she mean by really hard? What what should we look for? Well, you're having difficulty breathing. You're running a high temp. You're um, confused because your O2 levels are down. Um, O2 is? Your oxygen level is down. You're um, having a really hard time breathing. Mm-hmm. Aching. You're aching, aching all, all over, over severe sick. pain. Well, you said flu like right. symptoms. Mm-hmm. You're talking massive flu like symptoms. So, like the grizzly football team might have had this last mm-hmm. week. Right. The one thing that distinguishes the flu from hantavirus mm-hmm. is that hanta is usually not associated with sore throats or um, sinus infections or ear infections. So, if you're having you know, any of those things in this other you know, respiratory stuff, it's probably not Hanta. Hanta is associated with shortness of the breath and the, the fever. Okay. Fred, <laughs> we'll bring you on board here. I mean, you, you're sort of like the Oreo sitting here, you know, <laughs> between these two women. And, you, I must say they look much nicer than you do. But. <laughs> Who should be concerned? I mean, does this attack certain people over other people? Everyone should be concerned. Everyone who, outdoors people, uh, People who, uh, the various occupations we see, uh, loggers, utility men, uh, housewives even. Construction have, uh, workers. Construction workers, people who. Uh, Are there more, is it somebody who's, you know, um, more at risk? I mean, I guess what's coming to my mind right now is harvest season. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's the guys in the granaries and they're dropping in the grain, you know, which puts the virus airborne even probably more. What kind of precautions? Well, we see a lot of them people wearing dust masks, and uh, from what we're hearing from CDC is that them dust masks will provide a false sense of security because it doesn't filter out the virus itself. So putting on a dust mask can only filter out the dust. It won't filter out the virus. Uh, you could go with what they call a, a HEPA filter, and that's involving a half, a half mask with special cartridges on it that would f- filter out the virus. You probably have to pay a little bit for the... For the filtering mask. device and mask, mm-hmm. right, yeah. Okay. Well, I can relay a little story here, and maybe you can help me tell me if I was wrong or right or whatever. A couple of years ago, um, I had a bunch of pine cones stored in uh, polyurethane sacks, mm-hmm. and um, we're getting ready to load them, and um, as I pulled up one sack, there was a nest of mice there. Now, what I did is I just moved it away from where we were, <laughs> And said, okay, that th- I didn't touch that part, whatever got it moved. And uh, my wife made me go get the chlorine mix and spray that down and all this kind of stuff. I was saying we could do that later. Was I wrong? Mm, you were wrong. Your wife was right. I think she you should have listened to her. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> you should have listened to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. What should I have done? Well, you could have used chlorine bleach. Uh, you could use Lysol as a disinfectant to go ahead and spray in and around where that nest is, where the droppings are. Uh, if it wasn't in, if it was in an enclosed area, such as a trailer or small storage space, that would have propped the doors open and let it ventilate mm-hmm. a little bit. Mm-hmm. To going in and well, this was actually in a uh, um, a loafing shed. Loafing shed. It was it open or was it enclosed? It was open. It was open. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it should have had proper ventilation in there. But mm-hmm. like I said, some Lysol or some bleach solution spray. So now, what's a guy going to do in a granary? I mean, is there any way to? I mean, if you got to go in a granary, you know, and the grain's dropping in there, and they, they don't want to buy one of these special masks, what do they do? Well, I think they should receive some proper training beforehand. Uh, their employer should 
let them know that there is a, a risk of them acquiring hantavirus and uh, there are ways of protecting themselves through personal protective equipment such as the use of the, the cartridges if they're going in confined areas mm -hmm. and make sure ventilation's there if they're operating in and around an area where there's droppings uh, to make sure that they're bleached down. Mm -hmm. Wear gloves. Wear gloves. Wear gloves, gloves right. Make sure it's well ventilated. Mm -hmm. um, I've even seen a report that talks about using a fan to, you know, increase the ventilation for, you know, two hours before you go into an area that you might be suspect. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody's sitting out there right now, you know, and they're all of a sudden now they're opening up their windows in their house. Um, you know, they're they're scared to to you know touch anything. What should they do? Is this, is this, is there a paranoia? Are we going too far? I mean, six cases in Montana um, in the last, what, three years? Um, mm -hmm. What kind of precautions? Are we going to see more of this or? Well, I think a, a general assessment of your home will tell you. And mm -hmm. you, the more information you know about it, the better off you are. Mm -hmm. uh, you can get the information from Sandy, from Wendy, from any of our tribal community teams that are across the valley here. And uh, if you're interested, we've got handouts, pamphlets, brochures. We've got cleanup kits available to go out to the public here. And we've had numerous requests from. Mm -hmm. But uh, determine your infestation, whether it's light, moderate, heavy, uh, and then go from there. So is there a number that I can call? Um to get some information from you folks, or would that be the tribal health number down in Mission, or would that be the most accurate place? That's where I would start, 1-800-823-8228, um, mm -hmm. and um, ask for Fred or I. Okay, Fred or Sandy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Say, can I have I? <laughs> <laughs> um, what are some other things? How do we identify a, a uh, deer mouse? I mean, do they run around? Are they, they gray with horns? Or, I mean, that's a common misconception. Mm -hmm. uh, deer mouse is generally just white under the underneath, underneath its throat here, and it's got the, the wide ears on it. Mm -hmm. uh, similar to uh, the deer markings on a deer, and that's why they call it a deer mouse. Okay. Um, I wouldn't just be concerned with a deer mouse, I'd be <coughs> concerned with other rodents right. too, such as chipmunks such as moles or bulls that live in your garden they also have been known to carry the virus too so i'd treat all rodents as if they carry the disease okay um how do we get rid of the rodents do we use um what's the um the stuff that they eat and they die bait. <laughs> use bait <laughs> do you want to go over that fred yeah, you can use a decon's been used been recommended as a a brand that I know they've done a lot of uh, publicity on hantavirus and I'm sure it's helped them out in uh, trapping. The use of live traps uh, provided you use a bleach solution when you capture a mouse to disinfect everything then reset in, uh, the trap continually I guess on the outside there. Uh, mm -hmm. Cats are another good method. Mm -hmm. If you have a cat for the outdoor it'll definitely control the, the population surrounding your home. Mm -hmm. Well I remember back it was about 1993 when it first was coming sure out was. down in the Four Corners and um, you know, I remember the famous Dr. Gary Pitts was out talking about the hantavirus all over the place, and uh, they were saying not to use decon at that time because they said that the mouse would eat that, go someplace, and die and expose. Is that, have they changed that? Well, they, I think they have. CDC has changed it. Now they're recommending that poison is a control method mm -hmm. rather than having nothing out there. It's best that you do have some type of control and mm -hmm. recognizing poison. Mm -hmm. Provided it's properly placed in an area where uh, pets or children can't get into it. Mm -hmm. How about proper winterization of your house? Is that is that a positive? I mean, uh, winterizing your house as far as caulking and this kind of stuff does that keep mice out or? Uh, probably one of the best prevention methods you can do for the interior home is to make sure that your piping, as it comes to your homes, properly sealed. Uh, open up underneath your sinks and check down there where you generally see your pipes coming through the walls and seal up that area there. Uh, skirting around your trailers, skirting around your homes, uh, keeping the weeds down around your, your home, uh, placing your wood piles away from the home. There's a number of things you can do as preventive measures to keep the population right. down. So tall weeds around a house will attract mice? They um, expect that you should clear out an area 100 feet around your home mm -hmm. and so make sure that all your trash is away from your home your the wood pile anything that you know that's piled up clean that area you can also bait and trap that area mm -hmm. um, 
They also recommend that you use steel wool in any of the openings that are um, bigger than you know, a quarter of an inch and Is that amazing? mice can get through those. So wow. yeah, doors, windows, you know, check everything for little holes and clean those all up and patch them. Now what do you do with a, with a mouse if you trap one and um, you know, have it, you know, it's dead in your trap, what do you do with it? Do you, you know, throw it away and reset the trap again or? You see, um, can use rubber gloves, make sure that you wet it down with the disinfectant mm -hmm. and um, place it in a sealed bag and you should either bury it or burn it. Okay. Fred, you were talking about that there are um, packets that they can get that are already set up that have product in it. What's, what kind of products are in those, those bags? Well, back in 1993 when the outbreak first came out and uh, people were rushing to try to calm the, the public fear out there, the uh, Salish and Kootenai Housing Authority and and tribal health uh, got together to put together some uh, kits, what we called antivirus kits, uh, of which we placed uh, traps, uh, rubber gloves, a quart of bleach solution, and some uh, general materials, reading materials to use or to, to read and, and trying to control any of the rodents you may have around your home there. And we made that available to the public. And uh, I bet we've went through close to 500 of them because I know I, I don't have too many left but I'm thinking we're going to have some more made here soon. Mm -hmm. You're talking about a bleach solution. What if somebody doesn't want to come in but they want to make their own be uh, bleach solution? What is the ratios? 1 to 10. 1% 1 bleach solution to 10% um, water so 1 cup to 10 cups. Mm -hmm. The virus can be killed fairly easy and I think the 1 to 10 is due to the fact that if you're spraying bleach around you, you don't want to discolor any of the, your furniture, any of your, <laughs> oh, your clothing. clothes. <laughs> right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about keeping your home clean? What are some, what are some tips, Wendy? Um, keeping all of the um, food in storage containers, um, not leaving any food outside, your pet dishes outside so that the rodents can come up to eat and then go into the house keeping um, just the general area clean. And if you do find mouse droppings or um, an area that has, you've had a mouse, you need to spray that down because prevention is what we need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Because even one case as close as Sanders County, we can have a case here. And it, so it's really important that we need to um, prevent that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's probably only time before we do have that's, a case yeah, in Lake right. County or on the Flathead Reservation. Um, I had um, one more comment. Um, the food issues is very important because many of our people get commodities and this is um, an area where the mice do attract in people's houses. So, you know, the, you have um, those big heavy plastic five gallon buckets, you know, try to get th those and um, or metal sealable buckets and um, make sure and you know, keep your counters clean of food, wash your dishes. If you have trouble, you know, keep your pet food up off the floor at night. Just mm -hmm. try to like not have any um, food for the mice to eat. Okay, Fred, I think we should go over with you maybe one more time to be more specific as far as, you know, if I find some drop-ins that, that I know are, that are from a mouse, I spray that, now do I wait for that to dry before I sweep it and va or vacuum it up? How, how do I treat that dropping? I mean, I think once you spray it, the uh, it, virus is killed on contact. It's killed on contact, right, so it doesn't matter contact. if it dries or, no. okay, so it doesn't have to be slightly moist to, no. you know, to get rid of it or anything like that? We do recommend that you do not vacuum um, mouse droppings or um, sweep up the dirt. So, you know, spray it down, you can wipe it with a cloth and dispose of that in a correct way. Okay. Treatment of the hunter virus. Wendy, let's go back to you uh, since you're our, our, our nurse wonder mm -hmm. here, our Florence and Nightingale. <laughs> um, what kind of treatments do they have for the hantavirus at this There's time? There's no really specific treatment at this point in time except for early intervention of getting into the hospital. So if you're into respiratory distress, they can get oxygen, um, possible ventilators. They do give um, some antibiotics for um, that, but there's really no specific treatment. They test on a few drugs, drugs, antiviral drugs, but they haven't seen anything that 
is um, working right now, and so there's a lot of tests going on right now. It's pretty new. Well, let me put this out to, to the group. I mean, yeah. we don't want to cause paranoia here. Well, you know, and so I wake up tomorrow. There's no evidence of mice in my house. I have flu-like symptoms, but I remember seeing this show tonight, and all of a sudden, I'm getting a little bit short of breath. Should I go see the doctor? If you have had an exposure of mm -hmm. you know, being around rodents and you do have shortness of breath and fever, yeah, you should. And any time you have shortness of breath, that is um, a sign that you need to see your doctor. If you are short of breath, you need to get in. And if you're running a temp of over 101 uh, for adults, that's pretty significant. You mm -hmm. need to see your doctor. Okay. You know, that's what I'm trying to do, I guess, is we want information out there so people know what they should be doing and when and how. So, Hunter virus in the future, who wants to grab that one? I mean, what's going to happen in the future with this virus? Is it going to become like the bubonic plague or? Well, I do want to make one other note is that uh, there's different strains of the, the virus out there. Uh, oh, great. <laughs> A number of different right. strains, There's right? There's four different strains. Four different strains, the Han Kan, the Seoul, the Pumala, and the uh, Prospect Hill. Now, them four viruses, uh, I think, are all... Which ones, Wendy, uh, did they recognize within the United States here? It's the... Um, the no-name one. It's... Um, say those again. The Han Kan, the Seoul, the Pumala, and the Prospect Hill. Probably Prospect Hill. I think it's the Sumala. Mm -hmm. Or the that one is in the United the, States. The Pumala is a um, Asian virus, but I think the Asian ones in Europe. Asian in Europe. Mm -hmm. Mortality rates for the different strains varies too. And plus, they um, the different um, viruses like different rodents, and so they kind of attract to each other. Hmm. It's very interesting when you do the research behind it. Okay. As I said before, now, future, what, what are we looking for in the future? I mean, are medical science, are they getting their hands on the, you know, the cure of this or the prevention of this? What, what can we look for? I think we can look for what we've had, you know, so far, and I believe that a lot of the cases before were undiagnosed, mm -hmm. and so um, some of the mono, m pneumonia cases might have been hantavirus. Um, what we've there's been a, a case down in South America, I think there are six cases down there where Hanta was transferred person to person, and this is the first time that this has ever happened, and that was a deadly strain. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we really need to be cautious and be aware and just um, stay on top of it and, again, treat every you know um, dropping or rodent as if it's infected. Mm -hmm. You know, what I keep hearing, and it goes back to like most viruses and that kind of thing, is prevention, mm -hmm. right. hygiene. Um, can you give me anything else that you'd like to put out for information right now to, to anybody out there as far as um, how we can do that kind of prevention? Um, Fred, can they call you and have you come in and do a house check? I've. Believe it or not, I've been on maybe two dozen, three dozen house checks at the request of mm -hmm. the population out in the valley here. And uh, if I've got the time, I'll, I'll go out and run a quick assessment and let you know just how the uh, infestation problem is you're dealing with and mm -hmm. give you some recommendations. Okay. Wendy, how about yourself? What do you, do you see the uh, public health nurses doing for the uh, help of the control and the prevention of the hantavirus? Uh, we can provide educational information, we can come out to the house, we can um, do an assessment also, and we can um, instruct you on how to clean the area. Mm -hmm. um, are there any programs within the tribe right now that will help somebody who's elderly clean their place that way? CUR program, if you're eligible for the CUR program. Okay. And how would somebody, Sandy, check on that to see if they're eligible for that? I would call Tribal Health. Again, okay. um, I had a closing thought, okay. and um, Give us two. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is new to the doctors, and mm -hmm. um, if you go into the hospital and you have these symptoms, 
the doctors need to be aware that the state can do a 24-hour test mm -hmm. and most people believe it takes two weeks for the test but you know say you need this stat if someone's in acute or critical condition that test can be done now mm -hmm. okay so um, if a doctor doesn't know that tell them tell them <laughs> yeah <laughs> all right um, well guys I want to thank you um, mm -hmm. I think we probably covered this pretty well and um, if there is any information that somebody is desiring that they can call Tribal Health down in St. Ignatius at 1-800-823-8228. Um, you can get hold of Sandy um, Sorrell, our health educator. We can get hold of Fred Steele, who is our sanitarian, or get hold of any of our um, health teams, which are in um, St. Ignatius, Ronan, Polson, and or Elmo. And they would have information. And Arlie. Okay, Arlie goes through St. Ignatius, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Okay. And I guess I only have one last question, you know. Um, you know, the weather is changing. It's, you know, fall. It's, um, you just said the mice are starting to go in to the homes. Fred, I guess it's for you. Um, now, I know you graduated from Haskell down in Kansas. And uh, is it true that in this kind of weather, you actually gained 125 yards one time in a football game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was true. Is it true? All right, yeah. Randy, yeah. Sandy, and Randy, I want to thank you for your time. And for you out there, I hope this was informative. If you have any questions, please get hold of us. And thank you for your time today. Good day. Bye. Good Medicine is your program. We hope you watch this and subsequent programs to stay informed about your health care. And we'd like to hear from you about how we're doing. Please direct any comments or suggestions you have to us. You can reach us at 